Welcome. Uh, I am excited to be with you with Meredith here today. Um, we are talking about a very important uh, topic that's very close to my heart. And um, uh, the pandemic has really given us clarity why we should be diving deep and I'll, we will be making a case. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for telling us where you are from. Uh, somebody from South Dakota, Stephanie, welcome. Veronica from Virginia, welcome, welcome. So let's begin um, uh, by saying hello. Let me introduce myself. I am Sucheta Kamath. I am the founder and creator of EXQ. I am an award-winning speech and language pathologist, a TEDx speaker, and an entrepreneur these days. Uh, I have developed and launched uh, the software um, EXQ, and uh, we are here to make a difference in the uh, educational technology. I am also a motivational speaker and a, a well-known uh, spokesperson for executive function. And my specialization is neurogenic communication disorders. And for the last 25 years, I've been practicing and developing a curricula, developing activities and running programs in executive function. So switching to welcome Meredith, uh, please introduce yourself. Yes, hi, as Sucheta said, thank you to everyone for joining us this afternoon. I am Meredith Campbell. I'm the Senior Partnership Director for EXQ. And I've got an extensive background in education, uh, starting many years ago as a classroom teacher and a team lead, and then uh, ending as an education program specialist for uh, Cobb County Schools, which is one of North Metro Atlanta's uh, well-known large school districts. Uh, duly certified in both special education and general education, as well as with a literacy endorsement. Um, from there, I moved into, uh, some would say I, I, I crossed over to the dark side. I left the public school system after 15 years with the one system. Um, I have served as a regional partnership manager for a early literacy program and developing their first um, expansion into a nationwide program. And then I also served as the uh, director of school engagement and a director for university partnerships for Project Lead the Way prior to coming to EXQ. And we are excited to share with you today more about executive function and our uh, determination to, to help bring this to schools and improve our students' uh, learning engagement opportunities. Thank you, Meredith. So good to be here with you. So let me set the stage about what we are going to cover today. We are going to discuss executive function and why it is important now, especially during the current learning crisis. We are, secondly, we're going to talk about the evidence-based research linking executive function training with improved outcomes, uh, academic and beyond. And third, we're going to make a case to invest in executive function as a foundational curriculum, and particularly in the circles of uh, um, educational support we call that hidden curriculum. So let me begin with uh, this idea of executive function and why it's important for school leadership to consider this as an important aspect of student development. So um, nobody's born with executive function uh, skills. Science indicates that we learn and grow starting uh, around uh, middle school years, the learning to manage your own uh, role, goals and um, mission for self become much more relevant. And um, at the time of graduation, we call them soft skills, we call them common sense, we call them skills that are going to determine a student's ability to succeed beyond the um, kindergarten to 12th grade um, so to speak, protective wall uh, of education. So defining executive function, executive function is a set of mental skills uh, that we possess that enable us to um, connect past experiences, present goals in order to pay attention, plan, organize, problem solve, and create strategies to effectively manage school, work, relationship, and life. And that's the important part. It's not limited to school, it's, it's for life. And it's uh, in many uh, liter uh, pieces of literature, particularly in social psychology and uh, anthropology and, and um, connecting the neuroscience uh, to morality, uh, executive function skills seems to be determining a goal, a motivational maturation and uh, kind of uh, seem to be determinant factor of shaping moral compass. So uh, executive function is the ability to uh, appropriately adjust our thoughts, emotions, actions in accordance 
to the challenges in the environment and challenging times. So the most important thing here to remember is that adaptability. There are three core components to executive function, which is our impulse control, working memory, and adaptive flexibility or mental flexibility. And what does that adaptive flexibility really define? It defines resilience. So that means something didn't go my way. Am I adapting? Uh, something uh, is rubbing me the wrong way. Am I cooperating, collaborating, communicating? Am I advocating for myself? Something um, is giving me feedback that I am uh, doing really well on test, but my homework is never getting turned in. What's this gap in my performance? And am I adjusting my behaviors? And those uh, here may be talking about the most most um, challenging students are those who have the capacity to direct and guide their success, but they just don't have the means to it. And these means to seem to be these underlying mental uh, set of mental skills that govern our goal oriented behaviors. So uh, the hallmark of a, a student or all the students with strong executive functions seem to be broken down in, in these uh, the four categories. One is they're self-directed learners. That means they are able to define goals for themselves, but not only define, but they're able to manage those goals and convert them into achievement. And this is not necessarily even achievement that is measurable as grades, but these are, I, I want to be on time. That's a goal. And then I show up 10 minutes early. That's managing your goals and materializing your goals through actualizing actions. The second is these students are able to shift pivot and re-engage successfully to navigate change. And a navigating change is I was learning in person, now I'm going hybrid, then I'm going to be virtual, then back to hybrid and then back to in-person. That is requiring the students to really shine in the area of adaptive adjustability. And if you don't have that adaptive adjustability skills, then you're going to really struggle in knowing what to do and not having any difficulty being able to do because it's not a deficit in knowledge. It's, it's a deficit in process. The third uh, important um, key component is the empathic collaborator collaboration skills, which is understanding others, relating to others, and managing your goals in a collaborative way where you are achieving goals and so are other people. And so these are the students who actually are teacher helpers. You know, these are those students who never disrupt the class. They're easygoing, they say, sure. And then opposite of that, of course, is those who are not, are not able to um, manage their attention. They're disruptive. They kind of tend to ask a lot of questions. They seem to be a little bit re reluctant or re hesitant to do their part in a team process. And the last feature is that mental flexibility, which I can't emphasize enough. Uh, the student, uh, the longitudinal student study, the grant study that Harvard published um, um, uh, many, many years, years ago, and that talked about following people since 1930s. And uh, one key component that stood out is those who did well, fared well in life, uh, had one single factor that determined their success, and is that's their adaptive flexibility skills. And so that adaptive flexibility allows the students to take perspective of the other. They're able to understand the minds of the other. They are able to work with the teacher. They're able to work with a subject they hate because that subject is important. They're also able to work with a teacher who they find difficult, but because they understand the meaning of education. So now, What's, what are the benefits of having strong executive function in the classroom? Well, there are ample benefits to, to having strong executive function. These are the students who are able to engage with great sustained attention. They're able to monitor their engagement, motivation, and inclination. Uh, wait, wait, I, I'm not getting that. They are the ones who ask questions. They're the ones seek clarification. They're the ones who provide feedback to the teacher about their uh, journey in learning. Second, they're able to form goals and create plans, and they have incredible capacity to follow through. And as you know, making a list is least important compared to getting things done. So having a list is a great hack for your working memory, but that is not going to guarantee that you actually get things done on your list. So it's really that capacity to convert a goal into an action plan, action plan into a self-monitored through passage of time and then evaluating the outcomes of self. 
Uh, next, they are willingly able to engage in error analysis. They're totally open to receiving feedback, particularly even when it's unfavorable. And they are able to translate that past experience and connect it to the future self by really talking about what was the nature of the mistakes, what was the impact of the mistakes, and what are the consequences of the mistakes if they're un unintervened with. And, and that, again, all these things that I'm talking about, they depend on two critical metacognitive skills, which is self-awareness and self-devised strategic thinking. So students with strong executive functions in classroom are able to self-assess, self-correct, and self-monitor through passage of time. So if, <laughs> if you and I can relate to it as adults that uh, I have great intention to work on a paper or a project that I'm working on, and then I also keep my Netflix open, and then somewhere in the middle, I see that I'm more engulfed in Netflix. By the way, it's a bad idea to have Netflix and your project, but that's the kind of, of self-monitoring is, I think I'm not paying attention to my project. I need to turn off um, uh, uh, the television or turn off my uh, turn off notifications, um, close the door. Those kinds of simple things are signs of somebody who is able to um, ex apply their strong executive function to the need of, of the day. So now let's talk about lifelong impact of executive function. So uh, executive function now, it's not a mystery anymore. When I started my career uh, 22 years ago, we actually did not use the term executive function. Executive function to me, it has become a commonplace phenomenon in last 12 years, which are uh, 12 to 15 years, which excites me. But before that, we called it something else, as I mentioned earlier, either soft skills or we call them as, as uh, common sense. Uh, but in, in our our neuroscience field, we call them right hemisphere dysfunction. So I'm so glad that we have now collectively agreed to uh, to kind of settle on this uh, this concept of executive function because now we have studies. A group from New Zealand, uh, Terry Moffitt and and her colleagues um, followed uh, um, 1,037 children from this one particular um, town in New Zealand for three decades. And they published, uh, they have now published multiple, multiple papers. But one of the findings that are uh, really uh, important for our talk today is uh, impact of self control on long term outcomes. And what they found that that children who demonstrated greater self control 30 years down the road were able to hold better jobs. Their income was higher than their peers who did not have better self-control. They had better quality of health, less hospitalizations, less need for um, any um, uh, medicine. They, they had less need, uh, they had less struggles with obesity or diabetes, uh, some disorder, diseases that require a lot of uh, self-regulation uh, through habits of um, mind and daily habits. They also demonstrated longer rela stronger relationships means longer relationships. They were married longer. They had. They were in touch with their children more um, uh, in a close-knit way. And lastly, the biggest impact was seen in the fewer run-ins with the law. So the reason I'm, I'm giving you this particular study that kind of is not a, a sample, the sample size is very large and, and the time period is enormous. So uh, I, I can't find a better study to demonstrate the impact of this. So so now, uh, the evidence of struggles in executive function, those who whose hands, um, they may be doing hands-on stuff in classrooms, but those who may be doing more administrative managing decisions at the district level or at the state level, this is what we are seeing uh, with executive function, which is lack of motivation, lack of interest, uh, poor decision making, impulsivity, particularly driven by impulsivity. So what's that poor decision is to blurt out the answer. The poor decision is to grab something that belongs to somebody else. And, and one of the common descriptions of the, that teachers talk about is this disruptive behaviors tend to be the reason why the student becomes unmanageable and the learning how to learn is the 
breakdown and then their learning is becomes a secondary because now behavior management takes the the front seat and now behavior management as we know is not necessarily executive function management because there's some foundational skills that may be ignored or not given adequate attention or support but we are now trying to tame that child's behavior in the classroom uh, these students also lack the critical thinking and they're not able to solve problems for self. So executive function at, at its best is skill set that I do this for me based on my knowledge of me, based on goals I have for me, based on the obstacles I'm facing and based on the needs of my future self. So one critical commonality between executive function champions and, and those who are successful is they their eyes are set on the future self. And so, of course, those students in the classroom that are struggling um, in formal education, K-12 education, they have no concept of future self. Uh, the next couple of things is they uh, face often um, problems in collaboration and forming meaningful relationships. So they become these difficult to work with children. So their group members often complain they're not lifting their weight or they have not responded back or they're not reliable. So this can be a huge problem in a teacher's capacity, educators' capacity to really do this project-based learning or this, this kind of, um, uh, um, kind of uh, this, um, learning which requires collaboration amongst peers and teachers. And lastly, of course, as I said, uh, because of the disruptive behaviors that seem to be the undercurrent, there's general underachievement. And general underachievement um, um, can be a real concern because this affects the children from low socioeconomic background more than those who are not from there. And I'm going to dive deep into that uh, for a second because it's so critical. So I don't want to talk about just the abstract concepts of executive function. I want to take that and translate that to our educational context of subject specific learning. So as I like to describe it, there's a hidden agenda, hidden curriculum that needs to be taught in addition to the math curriculum, for example. So let's take example of math and uh, research shows that a student with strong uh, executive function skills score higher on math. The, apparently, they seem to be able to pay laser focused attention on math activities. They tend to be good at ignoring distraction, distracting thoughts, particularly those negative thoughts. Oh, shoot, I don't know what to do. They're able to curb that the interference of that better. They are able to hold math facts in mind while applying uh, the math facts effectively to current problem. And, and most importantly, they're able to flexibly shift between different strategies to solve complex uh, math problems to presented math facts. And so this is no surprise. Uh, and I don't we don't have time for me to talk about uh, impact or relationship between successful reading skills and, and uh, its uh, underpinning um, dominant, dominant presence of strong executive function, or let's take scientific learning. Um, so I'm just going to make a case with, uh, with math so you can apply that to other subject uh, specific learning. So now, though, if we take the same data, uh, where again, more than 700 students were studied, looked at, uh, uh, and what what the researchers found, this is this is the National Center for Education uh, Statistics Early Childhood Longitudinal Program, uh, that, and this is the fourth graders data, um, and what they found, if now you divide the group, separate them based on socioeconomic status what they found that the children from low income families had a, a much steeper graph or much steeper slope there than those who were coming from higher socioeconomic uh, background. So the math gap is very small, as you can see, if you only compare strong executive function skills. So student from low income or high income, their, their executive function skills, if they are strong, their mathematical achievement is pretty, pretty close to each other. So there's no socioeconomic disadvantage as such. But at the lower end of the spectrum, that becomes deeply concerning because this wide, this gap is so wide that now strong, um, that, that it becomes the determining factor whether these children are going to be able to build their math skills uh, to acquire next level of knowledge. So the students from low socioeconomic background begin to fall 
behind because their mathematical learning that hinged upon executive function is now causing a wider gap. Now, the interesting thing though, that strengthening executive function skills may have stronger benefits in low income students than high income students. And this is a profound findings for those who are really committed to uh, equity and equality and, and what we are seeing in the current climate, the pandemic, which I'm going to talk about in a second. This is really crucial for us to know that if there's an intervention provided to children with low socioeconomic backgrounds in with respect to executive function, that can have an incredible impact on their academic success and bridge the gap that is caused by the social uh, socioeconomic disadvantage. Very important thing to remember. So now, uh, there, this is a, um, a, I think this is two weeks ago, this data just came out. This is the MAP growth test. It's a, as, as you know, the MAP uh, growth test is a check-in assessment used to measure kids' math and reading skills that are generally given three times a year, in fall, winter, and spring. The fall 2020, 4.4 um, million children took this test. And this is the data. As you can see, pandemic certainly had an impact. Look, the, look at the impact though. In reading, the students did similarly to how other kids did last year when there was no pandemic. Very important thing to remember. But there was a moderate five to 10% gap. There was a slide in mathematics, uh, particularly because of the pandemic. Now, what is so critical uh, that is this missingness. So the authors of this study talk about um, a very important thing that actually 5.2 million children took this test in 2019. And we had, or, or even the winter of 2020, uh, before the pandemic was in full fledge. And in fall of 2020, we had almost 0.8 million children missing. And guess what? Who were these children who were missing? They were all from, it's suspected. They are uh, projecting that these were uh, children from low socioeconomic background. They have less access to internet and they were less available or because of um, the impact and its um, result in homelessness, a lot of these children were untraceable. So I'm again, once again, making a case that this gap is going to be wider. And then uh, going back to the previous slide that I shared with you, we, we have a tool, we have an approach that can really compensate for this problem, which is intervening with executive function focus. So executive function is the foundation for all aspects of learning. And the research shows that promoting the development of executive function skills with specific curricular activities has innumerable benefits. And this is not Sucheta Kamet saying, this is not Meredith Campbell saying, this is now long standing research findings, which I'll be sharing in a second. So before I do that, I wanted to kind of weave this uh, important element of the pandemic itself. And none of this research probably is going to be shocking. You may have a sense of it. Some of you may actually will find the numbers very beneficial so that you can have conversations with your uh, district and your leadership that why the timing could not have been better. So the 2020 pandemic reality and the nationwide fallout. So. Uh, um, um, Aaron Richards just wrote this article USA Today, and, and this is a worthy article, which we, ha we have listed here for you to look up. Um, so what the, she found, she reports that we are needing a disaster plan, just like what happened in New Orleans uh, a couple of years ago. We need a plan to not just rescue people in the current situation, but really the trajectory of the future selves of the children is off rocker and we need to get it back. So what, what we are seeing that plans to help students catch up are largely evolving, thin or non-existent. And this gradation is very much dependent on socioeconomic status of that school district. Second, children with disability and those with learning English have particularly struggled in the absence of in-class instruction huge important thing to remember. And lastly, low income and minority children are more likely to be learning remotely and less likely to have appropriate technology and home support that is likely to keep up 
because those are the parents who themselves are struggling with three jobs, trying to uh, bring in income and not lose their housing or be able to provide um, food to their family. And so the pressures are high. Now, let's not forget our educators. And I thank each and every one of you who is in business of helping children. And, and I thank of, of for your commitment because without you, uh, our children will really, really, uh, will not have um, a promising future. So what are teachers saying? So the key findings from American Educator Panel, this was the RAND Corporation research uh, report that came out in fall of 2022. Uh, what it, did it show? It's according to the teachers, students are less prepared to participate in grade level work. So again, going back to if learning how to learn is not in place, learning of content is going to be further behind. Second, they are having difficulty with student contact and accountability. Uh, and if you can't reach or, or grab onto the students, get their attention and their family's attention and engagement, how can you really ensure the support that you're willing to offer? The next is there is an ongoing problem with access to digital devices and internet. This has not seemed to have been figured out yet. And we are in December and uh, we kind of got a sense of the pandemic hitting us hard from March. So imagine that has still not been sorted out and teachers are expressing a particular need for more support uh, for themselves. And lastly, teachers are experiencing lowered morale and increased burnout. They are working longer hours. And, and uh, in spite of longer hours and incredible preparation and incredible willingness to you want me in person? Sure. You want me to be in virtual space? Sure. You want me to be in hybrid situation? Sure. They are saying sure because they care about their children, but they that can take a toll on an ongoing struggle because you need environmental response to your effort. Otherwise, you're going to have compassion fatigue. So the reason I'm mentioning all that, because there is an alarming picture that's emerging and we uh, as a community need to come together. And so um, the, this research, again, is the Rand Cor Corporation report says that uh, even though teachers are working more hours, than uh, they were before the pandemic, students are likely not getting all the curriculum content and instruction that they would have received during the normal school year. So I don't want to uh, uh, leave you with a bleak picture. I want to leave you with a great message of hope. So executive function research, as I mentioned, shows that in, by, by providing specific social emotional training and executive function training, students can be prepared with set of skills that will improve not just more their morale, but their ability to adjust their emotional response to crises and their ability to think creatively and think with great specificity about achieving goals that are created by self for self in order to continue to succeed in spite of ongoing roadblocks. So what, what are we seeing? So I am now giving you a Learning Policy Institute report from 2017. This is a summary of research outcomes. These are proven benefits of systematic and specific executive function and SEL training. So look at the findings. These findings are amazing. And I'm not saying this is as a result of a program. I'm talking about this is a result of approaches to building the hidden curriculum or strengthening the hidden curriculum that requires students to take agency over their learning. So what are we seeing? Improved classroom climate and instructional support. Teachers getting the cooperation from their children, even when things may be hard for the children. Second, improved um, uh, college and career readiness. What are those college and career readiness skills? ability to communicate, ability to collaborate, ability to advocate for, for yourself, ability to understand expectations, and ability to problem solve. Next, higher graduation rates. Amazing way to judge if all students are gaining access to equality and equity in learning. Next, a prevention of bullying and lower aggression, a reduction in teacher stress, Reduction is exclusionary discipline and discipline disparity. And as you know, discipline disparity, as I said, if a child is impulsive, the impulsive child is going to get greater punishment for the impulsivity, but the impulsiveness is failure of executive function coming online. 
and the prefrontal maturation will not be enhanced or elevated simply by punishing a child or sending him or making him sit outside or make, sending him to the principal's office. What it needs is strategies and techniques to know how to learn to manage self. And lastly, improved social performance, job outcomes, and higher educational achievement. So I wanted to, again, make sure all of you are really on board with me that executive function should be a top of the mind issue for all of us. And we need to find specific, strategic, and intentional ways of teaching that not to strugglers, but to all children, because these skills are associated with the development of the brain and they can be propelled into next tier of success through mastery that comes from, from deliberate practice. So now I would love to hand this over to Meredith. Thank you, Meredith, for being patient with me. And here you go. Thank you, Sucheta, for uh, painting such a vivid picture for us. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of you are nodding your heads as she explained what students with, with high executive function look like, as well as what students with executive dysfunction, because I know you have all recognized uh, many of each of those types of students in your classrooms. And the research that she shared with us does show that uh, there's a great importance for executive function in schools. Um, I think educators understand that there is a critical need. You guys see this firsthand. You understand that there's a correlation between positive student outcomes and strong executive function skills. So taking that into consideration, let's ask ourselves, how are schools addressing executive function learning issues? Unfortunately, there is a gap between knowing this type of training is beneficial and actually providing it systematically and explicitly. And we wanted to dive in and find out why. Uh, next slide, please, Sucheta. So this past year, just in June of 2020, we finished doing some research with EdDive to explore this gap. Uh, we wanted to explore uh, educators' understanding of executive function, how it relates to learning behaviors and outcomes, what they were or were not implementing at their schools across the country, and what barriers they might be facing in, in doing so. So we surveyed more than 130 education leaders and district administrators to answer these questions. And here's what we found. You can go to the next slide, Sucheta, thank you. So according to the research, educators recognize both social emotional learning and executive function skills as paramount to students' overall academic success, not only in the classroom, but beyond the classroom. As educators, of course, we want our students to do well uh, while they're in our classroom, while they're in our schools, but ultimately we wanna prepare them to be successful in life. Um, so when we ask these educators how important it is to teach students these types of skills in secondary education, 100% of educators emphatically replied that they were either very or extremely important. Um, overwhelmingly and across the board, administrators acknowledge the need for executive function skills. Uh, and we are specifically talking about secondary education, middle school and high school. And just to clarify the reasoning behind that a little, little bit more, Prior to that age at elementary school, we know that it is largely the parents and the classroom teachers that are staying on top of the students and managing their behaviors, managing what they are and are not uh, doing. Um, it's around that middle school age that students really start becoming accountable for managing themselves, managing their tasks, their work habits, their behaviors. And we're gonna dive into that a bit more in just a bit. But because of this, uh, this research that we did is focused on middle school and high school. So when we take a deeper look into this, although 100% of the people that we interviewed said it was important, when we looked deeper at the breakdown of those skills, only one of those 12 areas of executive function, recognizing strengths, was taught by even 60% of the respondents. The majority of the other skills that you can see outlined here were taught at less than half of the respondent schools. 12% of the schools said that they weren't doing any type of training or teaching of executive function skills. Now, taking into account that a lot of schools might be offering some strategies or occasional situational context um, for, for training in this matter, most schools really are not. Um, while some schools do have 
social emotional learning programs, which of course are, are also imperative and very important. A lot of those are more of a contextual, situational, passive type approach to um, you know, what to do if you see someone being bullied or what you should do if your friends are trying to peer pressure you into something. Um, very few schools do have any type of specific executive function training. And beyond that, some of the schools we know that say that they are, um, oftentimes they are offering a strategy such as providing agendas and thinking that that is teaching them explicitly how to organize and plan. Well, it's a strategy, but again, it's not systematically and consistently fundamentally giving those repetitious tips on how to uh, take charge of your executive function skills. So um, moving on past this slide, Sucheta, um, again, going to why we're focusing on, on that middle school level, a lot of times that is where students are really for the first time being responsible for um, changing classes, uh, being able to interact with more than one teacher and how he or she uh, assigns materials and the expectations of the classrooms. Um, and similarly, at this age group, it's the first time where they are understanding that their emotional control and being connected to their feelings um, really helps their overall uh, circumstance at school. They're learning for the first time to manage themselves uh, in their behaviors, their attitudes, their work study habits. Um, but a lot of times these students are given um, assignments based on the idea that they're ready to participate rather than the fact that they are really developmentally uh, ready to manage their own learning. Um, for example, a, a teacher might assign a long-term project um, and they give the due dates, they talk about what the expectations are, but they don't explicitly guide the students on how to understand how to prioritize those tasks or set up their own uh, timeframes, timelines to get works done. And the only grade that they get at the end is on that cumulative project. Um, and the time isn't taken to help the students understand the process that goes behind creating that project. So you can go to the next slide, please. So all of that is very relevant to understanding why executive function or EF skills are important, but we wanna go back to looking at why there's a gap. If we know nationwide that administrators and, and teachers are saying, yes, we need to do this in their schools, why aren't they doing it? And our research shows that despite the overwhelming need that there are numerous barriers. Obviously this one, uh, this year rather, the biggest one is this pandemic. It's thrown a bit of a wrench in everything. And uh, my hat's off to all of you because I know so much of your time has been spent on uh, just having your schools up and running, whether face-to-face -face or virtually, just knowing how to instruct our kids during this time. But aside from that, there are always other barriers that innovative educators have to uh, overcome when they wanna bring something new to their school. And uh, largely those barriers are, the three big ones are budget, administrator buy-in, and then not enough time. Um, that could be not enough time in your schedule. It could be not enough time uh, in, in your teacher schedules to have enough staff to, to teach those classes, or simply not enough time to provide the training for those teachers as well. Um, so one way to get over the buy-in hurdle is that uh, we have to link the program that we're wanting you to look at to academic outcomes. And again, this is linked to budget, which is the biggest barrier because in order for schools to wanna to spend their money on something, they need to know that it's going to make a, a difference on, their, um, on the outcome for their students learning. But there's a disconnect between how schools measure and align their academic outcomes and the effect that executive function skills has on their students. Again, going to another specific example, when a student gets a grade on a math test, they are only getting graded on their accuracy on that one test at that one moment in time. It doesn't monitor or track how much time they spent studying or the self-devised strategies they may have taught themselves, uh, any of those things that, again, go behind the scenes. It's only that final grade at the end. So there's a disconnect between uh, the executive function skills needed to learn and manage their learning goals versus the way that we measure academic progress. And in order to be able to better align this, 
educators need to have a way to collect and share data around executive function skills. Uh, this is something that largely in, is not seen. Um, and this might look like having students take a baseline assessment of their executive function skills. And through that, we can identify their areas of strengths and their areas of challenge. And then you can use a subject agnostic program with executive function skill building tasks based off of each individual student's strengths and weaknesses. And then you can begin to measure their progress and a meaningful correlation between their improvement in those executive function skills and improvement in their behavior, their work habits, and eventually their grades. For example, if we give teachers a tool that's well-prepared and goes into these deeper skill sets uh, and we provide um, specific frequent feedback to the students, they start to learn from their mistakes. And as they do that, they then change their behaviors both in school and out of school. And additionally, teachers can see not only what each of students' strengths and weaknesses are, but they can also track trends for their entire class. Uh, the more we know about how an individual student learns, the better we can differentiate and support them individually. But if we have that information on a class, we're able to see those trends to help us know how to uh, approach our lessons that we're implementing, how to structure and set up our classrooms to be most conducive for them. Uh, so for example, if you know that a majority of your students has a deficit in working memory, you can use that information to set your classroom up to be more supportive for them. You can know to have more visual cues out for them, for example. The flip side, if you find out that a majority of your class has really, really strong organization and planning skills, when you are going over and laying out a long-term project, you don't have to spend as much time on the, the individual details, knowing that the students can handle some of that planning for themselves. And just like you can look at this for your entire class, principals can look at these trends for an entire school, superintendents can look at it for an entire district. As we go on from, from that individual on up to the district level, the same fact is true, is that the more we know about how our students learn, the better that we can support, differentiate and scaffold their lessons and their learning environment. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, yes, thank you. So talking about these, uh, these barriers with the largest one being budget, uh, we wanted to look at how to help educators overcome that. Uh, while 76% of our respondents gave an emphatic yes when asked if every single school should be implementing an executive function curriculum, uh, achieving this objective nationwide has remained challenging. Um, and again, one of those biggest barriers is budget. But we do have some good news. For schools and districts that really understand the value and the return on investment of teaching executive function skills, there are ways to bridge funding gaps. Um, majority of schools do use their general budget to fund uh, a new curriculum or a digital solution, but others also use grants or some community partnerships. Um, those are commonly seen. But there are other possibilities as well. And some of these have actually popped up as a result of the pandemic. Um, there are some particular grants that ha have emerged to support technology and digital programming in schools. Um, also uh, last year, for instance, there was uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative launched a $50 million venture to support strengthening students' executive function skills specifically how they tie to math, exactly what Sucheta was referencing earlier. Um, again, there are different types of grants and such that exist for programs specifically identified that can help in these certain areas. Um, but beyond that, there are also um, corporate sponsored initiatives. There are a lot of social emotional support funds out there. Uh, CARES Act money uh, from the pandemic is being used to support new programs. Schools can use Title I or Title IV funds or PTA fundraising as well. And another thing that we've seen happening, and this tends to be more often in smaller towns, is that if you ask local businesses in your community, oftentimes they want to be involved, they want to give back to the schools and to the community, but they're not quite sure how to do it. And when they're approached, they're often willing to fund programs that go directly into the schools. Uh, not only is this a way to 
uh, impact the learning of the students that are going to be uh, future citizens of their community, but it also helps them ensure that good skills, good training, good education are going to their pipeline of future employers, uh, employees rather. So if we just get creative, oftentimes it seems like a challenge, but when we get creative and think outside of the box, there are a lot of different ways that funding can be uh, secured for new programs coming to the schools. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. So taking all of this information into consideration, we have acknowledged the overwhelming and crucial need for teaching executive function skills. Uh, we've talked about how to secure administrator buy-in by linking strong executive be function behaviors to improved academic, social, and emotional outcomes. And we've even explored a little bit about funding opportunities. So I'd like for us now to uh, turn it back over to Sucheta and she is going to share a little bit about what a good executive function training program should include. Sucheta? Thank you so much, Meredith. What a fabulous um, discussion so far. So yes, so now we made a case uh, that executive functions matter. And to me, uh, that should be a priority over other subjects, because if you teach learning how to learn, then you can learn anything. And that learning anything piece is really how do I apply my strengths and challenges to the demand on my learning. And so uh, let's talk about some features of a, a strong executive function curriculum. And again, watch the term curriculum. I am not, um, I, I'm a hardcore clinician. I've spent 22 years in this field, but I also have developed um, and implemented a curriculum for teachers uh, for three years in schools, training the entire entire school um, teaching staff. And, and then I went and developed something that actually directly brings this uh, a part uh, or this way of teaching and learning to directly to the students, because curriculum is not uh, to teach learning how to learn as a second thought. How about we keep that at the forefront front of learning? So number one, it needs to have a, a very spe specific and specialized individual learning assessment. So at the start, the students need to know what am I good at? What am I not good at? What happens to my ability to sustain my motivation and focus? What am I good at when it comes to paying attention when things are boring, annoying, tedious, complex? Secondly, this assessment should also give students information regarding their ability to predict what will be difficult for them and their ability to manage problems as they encounter, or what do they do with mistakes? So imagine a student receiving a profile that gives information about those, all those aspects that go into management of learning. Second, it needs to be customized. That means the training needs to be uh, given to every single student based on their strengths and challenges and not a teacher standing in front of the classroom giving instructions about good ways to learn and manage their homework manage their projects that is not unimportant at all i'm just saying you're going to have a range of development in and in inculcating those those recommendations into practical knowledge based on executive function so it, this is the catch-22 you need executive function skills to master executive function skills Skills. So that's why, what if you teach executive function skills using the principles of memory and attention and, and self-governance? -govern Third, it needs to be personalized. The coaching needs to be there. That means somebody who acts as a third person who brings a perspective that is not native to the user to the person who is being subjected to this curriculum. So I, as a student, need to know perspective of many students as they face similar information. And I need a perspective of the teacher who is giving me a best practices in learning and thinking. Next is metacognitive training. This is metacognition, to me, is the big boss that, that guides our thinking about thinking and, and thinking about our learning. So imagine giving information and guidelines and procedures that improve this ability to take a look at self from the perspective of the other and having two parts to your brain in, 
in, in cohesion. That means your prefrontal cortex that's guiding the decision making and the rest of the brain that actually follows the guidance of the prefrontal cortex. Next is measurement tools for monitoring progress need to be embedded into this part of introducing curriculum. That means the teacher needs a profile of the individual student, but she also needs a profile of the classroom. And how about the grade? And how about the entire school? So we, we implemented some things um, uh, recently and we had a takeaway with the head of the school giving profile of their entire high school. Now imagine if your entire high school profile shows dominant challenge in the area of organization and planning and dominant strength in mental flexibility. That is now giving you some information about how to restructure your educational approach at a programmatic level. And, and last couple of points is dedicated classroom time to and a course credit. So not a bypass, not pull out, not as an afterthought, not as a study strategy class that happens where students gather and do their homework because they are now given some time and guidance, not that. This is learning how to learn as a class exactly like math, algebra, Spanish, and, and even maybe Chinese and Russian uh, or having uh, your art class. And lastly, the, there has to be a community level engagement all at, uh, and, and the leadership engagement to create executive function curriculum. And I would love to share what that is next time when we do another webinar, but executive function curriculum is a, a, a executive function culture is a mindset of an entire community which believes believes in pausing and reflecting and is not afraid to look at mistakes and is bold about uh, disclosing strengths and challenges openly to each other and supporting each other as e each single member of that community works on their weaknesses. So with that, I will hand it back to Meredith. Thank you, Sucheta, for again, another wonderful summation there. Uh, so I want to share with you guys just very quickly some of the highlights about EXQ for School. And this is our version of the curriculum uh, that Sucheta just referenced, actually. Um, we are a 100% digital program. Uh, we didn't have to pivot during the pandemic. We were designed to be a digital program. And that is actually very beneficial right now because we've got folks with us today from all across the country. So we have a wide range of folks who uh, some have face-to-face -face learning going on, some are still 100% virtual, some are doing hybrid. Uh, because EXQ is digital, uh, your kids are gonna get the same content and the same consistent platform no matter where they log in from. Um, and EXQ, we meet those pr parameters to explicitly and systematically teach and build executive function skills. Uh, we do have several patents on the program. It is scientifically based. And uh, we utilize um, the platform through games, uh, error analysis, and metacognitive reflection lessons. And uh, it all starts with um, an assessment, very similar to what we've already talked about. It's a, a series of survey questions and practice games that students go through. And at the end, it, uh, it produces their EXQ profile. It outlines their area of greatest strength. It shows us their area of greatest challenge. And it also sets goals for them. They are allowed to self-select some of their own goals. We provide some goals for them based on the outcome of their assessment. From that point on, once the students have their assessment, everything else is completely individualized for them. The entire training system uh, is geared towards their individual results from that assessment, as well as how they interact with the system using AI. Uh, every student has uh, an individual uh, virtual coach, which uh, walks them through the entire um, rest of the programming. Uh, the next component that the coach helps them with is their error analysis. They're able to look at mistakes that they have made in the games, as well as shift perspective and watch someone else play the game and be able to strategize with how that person should um, alter their approach so that they don't make the same mistakes. The coach offers different mindset tips and uh, habits for them to use and helps them through this coaching process into what we call our meta training, which is the mindful examination of thinking and awareness training. Again, these are cognitive lessons that happen as well as focused self-reflection. Uh, without that reflection piece, without the students really taking a deep look inside, 
uh, understanding their strengths and their weaknesses, understanding where they have made mistakes and how they can avoid them from happening again, and really taking a, a deep look inside uh, and focusing on their own work habits, how they can improve them, and how they can take the steps to meet their goals. And then all of this is supported by our teacher portal. Uh, as I mentioned before, I had 15 years with the school system. So this teacher portal to me is huge because I know how much data means uh, and drives everything you do at the school. EXQ tracks the data for you. It is built into the system. Uh, teachers have individual access to their uh, every student, how they do on their assessment throughout the program. They also are able to, uh, much like I spoke to earlier, are able to check trends in their classroom um, across the system to be able to really support and create the best learning environment possible for their students. Um, also inside the teacher portal is a resource library that allows uh, teachers to take even a deeper dive into executive function, um, lesson plans, guidance on how to really create that EF culture in their classroom and in the school. Uh, again, uh, making sure that everyone's using a common language, that everyone knows we all have strengths and weaknesses. We are going to build our weaknesses. We're going to uh, strengthen our strengths and we are going to um, learn from our mistakes and move forward. So EXQ really is a, a one-stop, all-inclusive platform to provide teachers the ability to explicitly, easily, and effectively teach and monitor critical executive function skills. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes left. We're going to show at least part of a testimonial video to give you guys a deeper glimpse into uh, what kids are saying about EXQ. EXQ is a, a game to um, challenge your brain and to um, get you better at um, different study skills and whatnot and different um, skills that you that you will use in your everyday life. My favorite thing about EXQ is like the games and how you can go back and see like how you did and what you need to work on and like what your strengths and what your weaknesses are. I learned that everybody has weaknesses and everybody's not perfect but we're all different and unique so we all don't have the same differences and weaknesses. Well, I didn't know like my strengths and weaknesses as well as I do now. Like it really helped me uh, like point out what I'm really good at and what I have struggles with. It really helps me with my schoolwork, definitely in my homework. EXQ has um, shown me one of my weaknesses is focus. I have trouble focusing in lots of my classes, so it's helped me kind of realize that I need to work on that. I'd say the strategies really help. Um, like one of the things that I use uh, a lot is trying to break down um, what I do, what I try to break down my homework or try to break down like a big test or whatever. To definitely helping uh, doing that is a really good strategy that I like to use. EXQ wanted me to do a reflection video at the end and I think that it helped because it helped me know what I was struggling on in the first couple of weeks and to what I'm struggling with on the last couple of weeks and it's fun to see the difference between the way I was thinking. It's helped me keep going at things that sometimes are hard to do. Sometimes I'll want to give up on things and it's kind of like reminded me that not to give up on things just because there's usually a point in the end if you just keep on going. 